Okay, uh, let's get started. So apparently the projector is not working today, so I'm going to record straight from my camera and let's use the whiteboard instead. Sorry about that. Um, uh, you're, the people who haven't picked up your test one, I would recommend picking up your test one today. Uh, after today, if you want to pick up your test, you'll have to get it in my office hours. So are there any questions before we get started? No questions? Okay. So what did we talk about last time? Yeah, so we talked about these things called local variables, right? So what are local variables? So we can read slides, apparently. So, so, so can someone tell me in English what uh, was said there? So, like, what a local variable is supposedly mean? Variable that can only be used scope. Right. So I have a variable, and what we have thought of variables being their scopes so far is that you can only access it from where it's defined and through the rest of the function. So uh, that's how we have been thinking of variables so far. But now, since we have these things called what that allow us to access a variable outside of where it's defined? Re the reference, right. So uh, how do I make a, a variable a reference variable? Yeah, so if I want to make it a, a reference, let's see if I can spell it right. A reference variable, I go from the type, let's just say int, and I convert it to int. Uh, we usually call that int ref or int reference or uh, something like that. So the reference says, okay, uh, we can modify the original variable now. So if we have a function which t normally would take integer, or doesn't really matter, but let's just say integers, and if I don't put an ampersand on it, how am I passing the data to the function? By what? Value. By value, right, because I'm, it's not a reference. So could I modify the original uh, variable's value in the function then? So if I have like a, a function f, which takes an integer, let's just call it s, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter what return type it is. So and then let's just say we have the function like this with no reference on it. And then in the main function, or it doesn't really matter where, we call f with, uh, let's just say we have an integer x equal to something, and then we call f of x. Can I modify x through f over here? No, why? Right, so because we're passing by value. So is S going to have the same location in memory as X? No, because we're passing by value. Remember, passing by value means take the value that's there, make an independent copy for the function. So S here will get the same value as X over here, but it's not the same place in memory. Okay, so if we drew a memory map right here, let's just say x is right here, then let's just say it has value 5. Then what will happen when I come call f over here, uh, s is going to have the same value of, I probably shouldn't have picked 5, let's pick 3. So you can tell the difference. Uh, they're going to have the same value, but they're not the same place in memory. Okay. So that's passed by value. But what if I instead made this a reference on s? Could I now modify x from f? Yeah, why? How are we passing data now? By reference. So if I said, uh, I don't know, s plus equals 1, or plus plus, then if x had the value 5 before we call f, Let's just say that this is the only thing in the function. What is the value of x after I call f? 
6 because we're modifying the original. But if I instead did remove the reference, what is the value of x after I call f this time? It's still 5. So uh, just knowing the difference between pass by value and reference, that's pretty important. Um, then what did we talk about with respect to the arguments themselves? Starts, starts with D and ends with fault. Ah, oh, good. So default argument. So can anyone tell me what a default argument is? Right, so if we have a function with a default argument, if I don't provide a value to that uh, argument, then it will be initialized to the default. So it gives us some flexibility and say, we, you don't have to provide all the parameters, you just have to provide a few of them. And all of these other ones will be initialized to the default if you don't provide them. But if you do, then uh, it will be uh, initialized with the value that you have set it. So that's where we were last time. So you may be wondering, okay, we have these local variables now. Um, we know that it can be uh, accessed from inside the function where it's declared, so nothing new there. But what if we wanted to have, for whatever reason, a variable that can be accessed everywhere, regardless of where the uh, function is or how it's being accessed? So that's something called a global variable. So a global variable is basically a variable that can be accessed every, uh, in every place. So it's, uh, the reason why it's called global is that it can be defined outside of all functions. So the way that we have been doing everything so far is we have a function f, let's say, and then we have some integer that's declared inside of f, and then maybe another function, g, where we declare some function, um, sorry, a variable s, maybe with the value of f or something. So every variable that we've declared so far is inside a function, right? So the scope of x is everywhere from where it's declared through f and maybe other functions if there's a reference attached to the other function. But, but basically everything that we have defined so far has variables inside functions. A global variable is declared outside a function. So a global variable, let's use a different color for this. So let's have, uh, actually I'll make the lighting a little better uh, if I can. Oh, wrong button. So let's try this. Ah, a little better? Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so, so a global variable is precisely written like this. So let's just say we have an integer z equal to 10 or something. So it's not declared in any function at all. Okay? So, uh, but the great thing is that for a global variable, it can be accessed everywhere. So inside f, I could say uh, c out... Uh, x plus z or something. Or something like that. So I can use this global variable everywhere. So, can anyone think, so this is obviously advantageous in some ways because now you don't have to worry about the scope of z because it's just accessed everywhere. What's the potential downside? Yeah. Right, because, because it can be accessed everywhere, well, could G also modify the, this global variable Z? Could, yeah, G could modify it, F could modify it, the main function could modify it. Every function can modify it. So now you have to worry about, okay, um, if all of these functions are modifying this global variable, then it could be, now we have to think about how it's being modified and which functions are executed when. So is G being called first? Is F being called first? Is main calling F, then G, then maybe G could be calling F? So 
understanding how Z could be modified is actually really, really, really hard. And is actually one of the reasons why people have been so adamant about not using global variables. So global variables are almost always a bad idea, but you still see people doing it. Yeah. So one example of something, because you could set a global variable as a constant, don't you? Exactly. So what is one way that we can mitigate against Z being modified everywhere in the program? Set it as a constant. So if we put const on the front, then we don't have to worry about that because Z can't be modified. And so that is one of the uh, only use cases I could ever think of of why someone would want to use a global variable. They want to be able to use it everywhere, but they don't have to want to worry about the variable changing, so they put const on it. So if you're going to ever use global variables, always use const because it's the right thing to do. So you don't have to worry about like uh, any function modifying it. Okay, uh, yeah, so on the slide, which you can't see, uh, it says use sparingly for that reason. So, uh, so here is something that's kind of interesting. So I inadvertently did this on purpose. <laughs> um, let's look at this variable x right here. So what is it uh, initialized to? Integer. Well, well, it's an integer, but what value? So we have a, an answer of zero. Any other guess? It's, it's not initialized to any value. It's the, the features of a random memory place number. Right. So it's actually, uh, you can't actually specify what the exact value of x is here. What about a global scope? So let's just, uh, maybe not const here. So let's just say uh, we, fall, we fall down and hit our head and just say, yeah, we're not putting const on this. What is Z initialized to? Well, think about it. Z, uh, so X in this case will only be created if F is, right? What happens about Z? Is it in any function? No, it's not in any function. So do we need to worry about initializing Z at some later point? No, we don't have to worry about that because it's outside of every function. It's a global variable. So what happens with global variables is that they are default initialized to zero. So all global variables unless you provide a value to them, are default initialized to zero. So the reasoning for this is that uh, when you're doing the, uh, when you're doing compiling and running, uh, there, when you, let's just say you call f, it takes a little, but some amount of time to actually create four bytes for this integer x. It takes time to allocate memory so that you can use X. Whereas when you compile, it automatically uh, uh, creates four bytes for this integer C, so you don't have to worry about initializing it later. So what happens is uh, when you push run on the program, you don't, have, you don't actually pay for any runtime cost of initializing this variable Z. So when you push run, your program runs as fast as possible. Whereas here, if it created the memory needed to initialize x, that's additional work that's needed. Whereas with a global variable, it's always going to be there anyway, so you don't pay anything extra. So that's why global variables are default initialized to zero, because you essentially get them for free. Uh, for uh, anything else where you're defining them not at global scope, and another thing that we'll talk about like in a few weeks. Um, but if you have something else other than a global, it's going to be, uh, it's not initialized to anything, not necessarily. So if I, for whatever reason, did this function like I'm just going to print x and nothing else, well, new line, but no, nothing else other than that, I might get not zero. I may get zero, but I probably won't. 
So that's just some things that you need to worry about sometimes. So what my recommendation is, is whenever you have a local variable like this, initialize it to zero, uh, unless you have a value to give to it. If you're assigning like some other value like 42, uh, then just you have to do that anyway. But if you don't want to initialize this to anything right off the bat, initialize it to zero because uh, there's no need to do so otherwise. Any questions about local and global variables? Yeah. So can the a global variable be modified even if it's not by reference? Yes. So if I have an integer C like this, this is just a normal integer, essentially. So I could say in the G function, like <coughs> Z plus equals one, for instance. So I could modify any global variable that's not const anywhere. So uh, it doesn't even matter if it's a reference or not. So I can modify it anywhere. Other questions about local, global variables? Okay, so next slide is global constants, which you also can't see. Um, okay, so, th so here's something that's even more interesting. Well, let's see. Suppose that... Um, we do want something that's like this. So we want a global variable, global variable, that can be modified like this variable z here. But we don't want to have the pitfalls of some other function being able to modify it. So maybe, for instance, what we could do is, let's do a quick example of a function which returns the number of times that it, that function has been called. So let's just say that in the main function I call f, then it should return one, which means that f has been called once now. Then if we call f again, it should return two, so that uh, it tells us, hey, this function has been called twice. So that could be really useful in determining where uh, all the work is being spent. Is it all in this function? Is it being called many times, or is it in this function? So, can anyone tell me uh, a really easy way of doing that? Yeah, so you do a global variable. So let's just say we have an integer f, because it always has to return an integer in this case. Number of times, you can't call a function half the time, I don't think. So let's see. So what we can do is just say, let's just say we have a global variable initialized to zero, although that's not necessary for globals. Then what, what can we do inside f to, uh, say how many times f has been called. Uh, yeah, so n plus plus to say, oh, we called it again, and then what should we return? Return n, yeah. Super, super simple. So if we call f, or maybe we just see out f, the calling the function f, and then we call f again, So I'm going to be a compiler for a second. I'm compiling, I'm compiling. And then I, I push a dot out. Then what will be printed? One, two. Because if we just trace through and say, OK, we're trying to see out f. It goes in here. It adds one to n. So n has now value what? One. It returns one. So it prints one. New line. Come down here. See out. Call it f again. N plus plus, now n has value one. Two. two. So we return? Two. two. Good. So then we see out two, and that's the behavior we get. Pretty cool. So uh, that, that's definitely really simple and really uh, useful. But what's the downside of this? What if you reference that counter in any other function? Right. So if we reference this variable anywhere else, then no, we can't really say anything else now. Kind of a bummer. So what could we do? Well, what we could try to do is say, OK, we, we clearly can't have this, right? Because n uh, shouldn't be a global for that reason. But can I put const here? No. No, because I need to modify that variable. Because if I call f again, I want to change the value, but const won't let me. So it seems like. There isn't a way out of this. There is a way. 
So enter the keyword static. So what does static do? Static says treat it like a global variable in some sense, but also a local variable. So it's like a global and a local variable at the same time. So here's how you do it. Uh, I'm going to actually write it and then I'll tell you what it actually means. So I'm going to make a static int x set to 0. I need to set 0 in this case. I do x plus plus, or maybe I should have done that, it doesn't matter really. And then return x. So I'm making a static variable right here inside the f function. I'm calling plus plus on it and returning it. Before I get to static, let's just say I didn't know what that keyword static was, and I just did that. I just made a local variable int x, added one to it, returned it. What will be printed other than one and two this time? One, and then I call f again. What does it also return? One. So clearly I can't do this either, because every time f is called, this variable is going to be set to zero again. Let's remove the, uh, I don't know what it is, strike through, static. Let's do static now. So what does static mean? Static means no matter how many times f is called, allocate x exactly once. So that just means essentially treat it like a global, but also, so in the sense that you're only allocating the variable one time regardless of how many times f is called. So if you call f 10,000 times, x will only be uh, initialized once. It'll only be created once. So when I call this function the first time, x is created in some memory. Then we add one, return one, then that's all done. But x is still there. So if we didn't have a static uh, integer here, then what would happen is when f is done, uh, when we return right here from f, then x is deleted from memory. It's, uh, it's not allocated anymore, it's deallocated as it's called. We're, and then when we call f again, it's reallocated and then deallocated again. If you have a static variable, it's allocated the first time you call it, and it's never deallocated until the program quits, okay? So x, there's only one copy of x at all times whenever you have a static variable. So it's treated like global in that there's only one copy. But the advantage here is that x can only be accessed inside the f function. So I can't access x down in main or globally or anywhere else. So that's one of the distinct advantages of static here. So you have exactly one copy and uh, you can't access it anywhere else. So let's actually trace through this. So we, so if at this point, before I even execute these two f calls right here, is x initialized? No, because f hasn't been called yet. So x is still a local variable, meaning when we call the function, then it's allocated. So. Before we even call f, it's not allocated, so uh, yeah. So then when we call f here, we then allocate x, so it has value what before we do anything else? So just this first line of f. It just has zero, right? So then we do x plus plus, and then now it has value what? One. So when we return one, is x deallocated when, we, when f stops? No. So x is still in memory somewhere with value what? One. So but then we call clf, it prints one as we expect. We call f again. X has value what? One. Does this assignment change anything? No. So what I said by created once means this initialization of zero happens once. So when it's created, it's set to zero, but when you call f again, it's not reinitialized. There's only one copy. So now, it has value one, x plus plus turns that to 
we get two. And we return two. And so now we print two. So now you have to think, okay, I can have local variables in some cases, global variables in some cases, and static variables in other cases. So depending on what the use case is, static variables, like in this case, are a lot better than the other two options. Or maybe global variables are in the case of when you need something that's uh, available to all functions and preferably is constant then you should have a global variable. But what if you have a variable that's, that should only be accessed inside this function and you don't need to keep it around between multiple calls? Should you use a local, a static, or a global variable? Uh, a local. Because if it's only available inside this function, then global's out of, uh, out of the question because I only want it in this function. But if I don't need it to keep it around anymore between multiple calls, do I need static for that? No, I actually don't need it for that. So uh, you would need a local in that case. But any questions on static? Yeah. Let's say, well, this is also quite global. Let's say you, um, your function is to square something, and you need to return the square value, but you also need to return x. Uh, I'm not sure what the question is. You mean, so if we have a... Is it using x as the problem? Okay, so you have an integer square function, and does it take any parameters? Yeah, so like... An integer x, okay. But then you also have a comment, so you need to return two values. And right? you have a what? A comment, to see how many times it runs, just like how you did it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, good point. So. We have this f function which tells us uh, how many times a function has been called, or in this case, how many times f has been called. What he's asking is, well, can we return uh, two values, namely the number of times the square function has been called, as well as the actual square of x. So I definitely need to uh, return uh, x times x. I need to do that for sure. But what he's asking is, can I do uh, some hybrid behavior where I'm counting the number of times square has been called and returning that also? The answer is yes and no. So if you want the easy answer, the answer is no. So uh, you can only return one entity in some sense. So you can have a counter? You can have a counter in the sense that you can't return it like this. What you would need in that case is you need a global variable. Uh, n equals zero, and then n plus plus in here, and not return it. And then that, that is okay, and then access n somewhere else. But then obviously the disadvantage is that you can access and modify n in other places. But there, there is another way around it. Could you use a pass by reference counter? Yeah, but then I would need another, uh, I need to have that parameter in the other function. Whereas I'm trying to keep the variables uh, only inside this function, I want it to be a local variable. Because if I had it by reference, I could modify the other function. So there is another way, and if you're curious, uh, look up this entity called standard pair. Uh, you're not required to know what that does, but essentially it is one thing that we're gonna talk about pretty soon, uh, where you can put two values together. And it's one entity, but you really are, in some sense, returning multiple things. But, uh, so if you're curious, look at that. But the short answer is you can't return multiple values at the same time. So standard pairs an object in that? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, it is. Other questions? Okay, so uh, we kind of talked about this before. I'm just gonna briefly go over it. So. If you tried to call the square root function, so if we had the square root function, could I pass just the value five into it? Yeah. Could I pass square root 5.1? It, it, it seems simple, but is it true? Can I act, send in a double? Yeah. So 
Is there a difference here? What type is a 5? Integer. What type is 5.1? Are those the exact same? No. So in fact, what is happening here is that square root has multiple versions depending on what you pass in. So we could have a, uh, a square root that takes an integer x. So I'm actually kind of lying a little bit, but it's to get the point across. Uh, but we could have a version of square root. We could have a version of square root that uh, has an int and a different version which takes a double. But so that is kind of lying. But the real a real example of this is think of CL. So yeah, I can print an integer, but what is this? A string. So are those really the same? No, they're, they're not at all the same. But CL works with anything that you pass. So what happens here is something called overloading. So overloading means that we have a function with the exact same name, so literally identical same name, but the parameters are different. So either the number of parameters is different, so maybe for whatever reason we could have a square root with two parameters here and one parameter here. So if they have a different number of parameters, they are different functions, even though they have the same name. But if you have the same uh, number of arguments like here, we have one here and one here, then if they are different types, then you can have both of them simultaneously. So that's the concept of overloading. The function, you have multiple functions of the identical name, I, literally the same name, but either the number of parameters is different, or if they're the same, the, uh, the types, at least one of them is different. So if I have an int version here, a double version here, maybe for whatever reason, a string version down here, those, are, they, those can all live in harmony together. But if it's determined that you could have, if you have two versions which take an int, then the compiler is going to complain and say, oh, did you mean this one or this one? Because you can't really distinguish between the two. But if you have the functions being different, in the sense that different number of parameters or same number but different types, then it's very easy for the compiler to say, oh, you mean this one instead of this one. Yeah? Could you use that as like a replacement for an if function, technically? Uh, if and what do you mean by that? So basically, by having both of those, it would say, like, if the output is an integer, then use this function. If the output is a double, then use the other function. Yes. So the question. So the question is, uh, could you determine to say, okay? So I, could you determine to say, uh, we have something like this. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. So could you determine from like main if the input or output or whatever is an integer, call this room, and if it's a double, call this one. Uh, that's something that is really, really technical, and we'll get to it. But. Well, the, the, the thing that came to mind was the question on the test where it talked about finding perfect squares. Yeah. Is like this exactly right here would like would work for that. Because like the square root of an integer, you could do like. Oh, oh, okay. So, so you could use that, like the square root of integer x, like if it came out to an even amount, then it would be true. And then... Okay, so what you're saying is that if I call square root, so let's just say I call this one. It could return to me an integer or a double. Is that what you're saying? So like, you mean like, depending on what was passed in, the return type could be different. Yes. Yes. So that is something that is a new feature of C++ 17. So it came out like a year and a half ago. So it's very, very, very technical, and we will definitely get to it, I hope. Uh, but basically, uh, it relies on something called if const expert, but we'll get to that, okay. hopefully. But basically, in that case, you could determine at compile time 
exactly what return type should the function be. But uh, for what we know, there's no way to do that. So uh, for our purposes, a function has exactly one return type, and that's still true even with that addition. Um, but here we have one fixed type. So it always will return to you a double, no matter what. So you could return an integer, but an integer can be converted to a double, so that's fine, which is why I was lying a little bit. But, uh, yeah, so it could be given to you, the double that's given to you is an integer, but it has a point zero after it. So if you could determine afterward that this really is encoding an integer, but it just has a point zero on it, then you could say something there. But uh, here you can. Other questions? Okay, so we talked about overloading. Uh, one last thing. So uh, I asked you uh, maybe last class where, uh, where we had return zero in the main function. So in the main function, what does return zero do for what we know? It ends the program. But what if we return zero from a function? Does that end the program? What if we wanted to end the program from a function that's not the main one? Yeah, so there's this function called exit. So let's just say we have a function f. And we have like some code, it doesn't really matter. And then let's just say we have some bad thing that could happen. So maybe like the user entered invalid input. We can't just say return zero here because it'll jump back to the previous function, maybe the main one, and then continue execution. We want to stop the program right here. So there is a function that allows us to do this called the exit function. So maybe we can say exit of, well, if something bad happened, maybe we need to actually say something bad happened. And so you could provide the same integer that you provided to the main function. So like if you return zero or return something else, you provide the same thing here. So let's just say we put zero just as an example. And so what would happen is if this, ex this if, uh, condition is true, then exit zero is called, which what happens is the program quits. So it's, it essentially does return zero from the main function. That's all it does. So if you need it for whatever reason to stop the program from something other than the main function, exit's the only way to go. Because you can't just return zero from the function because it'll just jump back to wherever it was before. Any questions on the exit function? Would you use that for like monitoring? Like, um, I'm just trying to think of a situation where you would use that, like mm -hmm. kind of outside the scope here, but like if you had like temperature monitoring on a CPU or something like that, and the temperature got over a certain... Yeah, so that'd be a, a good application of this, where you definitely want the program to stop, no matter what, so maybe something like uh, temperature is rising too high if you're monitoring that, or if you determine for whatever reason that you're trying to divide by an integer and the integer that was given is zero, then what you could give is something called an exception, which we haven't gotten to yet. But what happens is that the program will print out an error message and stop right then. So what you would do in this case for an exit zero type situation is print an error saying, yeah, you did something wrong here, and then call exit. And then now you can communicate to the user, hey, you did something wrong here, but then not harm anything else by having the program stop. And I can't return zero here for obvious reasons. So you do need the exit function, but typically what people do is you do something else other than the exit function. Like, print some helpful error message to the user. Other questions on exit? Yeah. Can you use any other value than zero? Yes. So if you look in the slides, there's actually something called a macro. But essentially, you can use any integer that you want. What, what it, the integer means is that zero means the program exited successfully. So like nothing bad happened. Any non-zero value means that the program did something bad, something catastrophic might happen, we're stopping right now. So there's a macro for zero. Uh, we could substitute for this to 
the macro by literally copying and pasting in here something called exit success, all in caps. And if we wanted to use one, that would be exit failure. So we haven't talked about macros yet, but essentially what these mean are exit success is defined to have the value zero, exit failure is defined to have the value one. <laughs> Uh, so what happens when you compile is literally, if this exists in your program, it exits success, zero is literally copied and replaced with this. Or, or sorry, this is uh, replaced with every place with zero. Uh, if you see this, it's replaced with one automatically for you. So uh, this is a lot easier to read than zero. Other questions? Let's move on to next chapter then, because that's it, yeah. So there's some caveats to all these, uh, so make sure to look at the actual slides for this. Okay, so let's say we want to actually build an application, like really build something for ASU, for instance. So let's just say that uh, we're building some social networking service for students, okay? So students can sign up, they provide their name and their <coughs> birthday and age or whatever, although those are the same thing. Um, so they provide some data to the application and the application stores it. Well, let's see, are the first and last, so let's just say we look at Ryan Doherty, the name Ryan Doherty, are those both attached to me? Yeah, so if I just had uh, the, first name Ryan, and then some other place, the string Doherty, would that be a, a good way of doing it? Or would you rather put both of those pieces of data together in the same place? Uh, probably in the same place. So there are legitimate reasons why you want them separate, but if we're going to actually build something where we're going to have students or uh, entities in general being able to work with each other and maybe ask questions about the entities, maybe we want all the data associated with an entity, like the name and the age and whatever, all tied to the same entity. I don't need to look over here for the name and then here for the age and then uh, here for something else. I don't need to look in multiple places. I look in exactly one entity. So I think that's a better idea than having the pieces of data separate. So that is something called an object. So an object is basically tying a bunch of data all in one place. So instead of having data here, here, or here, I can put it all in one place. So think back to the, uh, the in and out menu assignment that you did where you had the, the number of burgers that were ordered, number of double doubles here, number of normal burgers here, number of drinks here, number of fries here. All these pieces of data are in separate locations. All of these integers are in different locations. It kind of makes sense to tie them all together because each, uh, each order by the person has a certain number associated to each uh, menu item. So you want to put all of that data in exactly one place. That's what an object is. So what's an, uh, before we even talk about objects, there's another name for them that people sometimes use called uh, an abstract data type. And sometimes that's called ABT. So an abstract data type is something that you define. So maybe like a, a restaurant order or a person on a social networking service. It's something that you define uh, where you store values. So what you do is you store values, uh, uh, maybe one or more, into this ADT, and then you query in my words, uh, about values. So maybe what you can do is say, 
I'm going to put all this data about the order in one place, and then when I want to print the order, I can just say, uh, what is the number of double doubles that you ordered? For I'm asking one order. How many double doubles did you order? How many of this did you order? How many of this did you order? And then, so I'm asking this one ADT or object about the values that it contains. So all it really is is a wrapper for a bunch of values, all in one place. Uh, but also, what you can do is you query about the values uh, through operations. So what you can do is say, we're storing these values here, but we're going to provide some handy operations so that you can maybe manipulate the values or print them or return them or anything that you want. So what you can do is say, let's just say we have a student uh, ADT. So this is an abstract data type. What values may you want to know about this person? Uh, yeah, name. So let's actually break that up. So maybe the uh, first name, and then last name, and then maybe age. What other things maybe may we want to know? Uh, ID, ID for sure. Um, uh, maybe innovator level. <laughs> we are at a issue, by the way. Um, what else made me want to know? GPA maybe for, for what? <laughs> Let's roll with it. Eye color. If I can spell eye color. Um, maybe GPA. Let's let's just go with those. So maybe some oper. So what maybe an operation we would want to do? Well, maybe we want to uh, figure out what is the GPA. So, so what are some operations? Uh, determine GPA. And so uh, an operation like that may be just to say, oh, what is the value stored in this, in this variable GPA? But another one that's more non-trivial may be uh, uh, print um, transcript. So uh, I have this student right here. I want to get the transcript of that, of that student, maybe for uh, grant purposes or something. So you want to know the transcript. Well, you would need to, in that operation, you need to look up, okay, what is your first name, last name? Uh, you probably don't know, need to know age. You definitely need to know ID. <laughs> probably not. Uh, probably not. But GPA, you definitely need to know. So some operations, you look up one value. Uh, some other operations, you need to look up multiple values and then maybe lay them out and print them in a certain way. So some, op uh, some operations can be very complicated, whereas some can be really simple. But in general, an ADT has a bunch of values like these and a bunch of operations that you define, such as those. Okay, any questions? Let's see, do we have anything else? Let's talk about that next time. So I'll see you all on Wednesday.